frame the issue. Why are we interested in ecotourism? Um, what we have witnessed is basically a, a new trend in supporting ecotourism as an agent of sustainable development, especially when we are talking about fragile environments. Ecotourism was defined by its impacts, mostly conservation, benefits, learning, engaging, um, changing behaviors, and all of that. But the problem is that we, don't have, we didn't have any tools to measure these impacts. So how can we say that something is sustainable if we cannot measure it? So what I have tried to do is to develop a general framework for ecotourism, sustainability, specifically designed for fragile environment or protected areas, uh, and verify if it really exists in real life. The second step is to develop uh, a tool to measure it. So I will not bore you with the different uh, steps of the research because you will find this. Uh, I'll just take the headlines. The first thing is the framework, the conceptual framework, the protected area ecotourism sustainability framework. Uh, the second step is its verification in real life. Then we move into the indicators. What kind of indicators can we use? Can we use only economic indicators, social indicators, or other types or ecological indicators? And finally, the final step was merging all of them into interdisciplinary com composite index, which is the index of sustainable ecotourism impacts. So I will not go through the methodology because this you can find uh, in the paper. Uh, the first thing about the case study protocol is just to, uh, it contained certain criteria for the selection of the case study. Um, there was a field procedure, of course, uh, and data collection, primary data collection, as well as secondary. The elaboration was done through content analysis. So basically, due to the lack of statistics uh, in the tourism field that can tell us really whether about the qualitative side of it, uh, we use content analysis to verify the existence of the, the framework. So we use NVivo 7 for conducting the content analysis. And now we're moving to our findings. So this is what the conceptual framework looks like. So if I may explain it in a couple of words, it starts by uh, the main thing in protected area, what we have witnessed or what we are uh, proposing is that it's the physical plant that is at the center of any ecotourism activity in protected area. And by the physical plant here, we mean the natural physical plant and the man-made physical plant. Um, this goes through a process of resource management and produces what we call the biophysical effects. On a second level, we also have the operational part which start by the services and hospitality, specific to the tourism uh, industry. So it goes through tourism management to produce socioeconomic impacts. And on the third level, we have the engagement level or the human uh, factor. So we have the involvement of the different stakeholders, whether they are visitors, local authorities, whatever. And they go into the stakeholder management uh, process in order to produce what we call cognitive effects. So with the cognitive effects, we have the behavioral change. With the socioeconomic, we have, of course, the, the wealth, the development, the economic part. And with uh, the physical plant or the biophysical effects, we have the ecological impacts, and they all relate together in, uh, in producing recurrent effects. So in order not to bore you with the, the numbers that we have found, I'll just go directly to uh, the results. 
in plain words. So the first thing that we noticed about the physical plant, when we examined the, the case of Wedil Gemel, we found out that cultural heritage represents the first uh, or the most important type of attraction. It starts by the intangible cultural heritage, followed by the tangible cultural heritage. The second attraction was biodiversity. And the third was the natural heritage. Well, that seemed like very logical, with the only problem is that this is a protected area. It was declared as a protected area, I think in 2003, by virtue of laws, the, the protection laws 102 uh, for the year 83 and four for the year 94 to protect biodiversity, which means that we are protecting the wrong attraction. So this is the first challenge that we found. We have cultural uh, heritage, which is our most important attraction that is left unprotected, whereas we're protecting biodiversity. The second point was about tourism services and management. So when we compared the purpose of ecotourism development, we found that public authorities were mostly interested in the diversification of tourism product and attraction new types of tourists. Whereas for the industry itself, it was setting up new tourism services or new markets, offering informative tours and quality service, increasing the visitation numbers, educating visitors, educating locals on the industry, which means that we need to sit together and understand which view corresponds more closely to the local community's expectations. And in that regard, I found that the private sector or the industry itself responds better to the community's requirements. Now, when it comes to the services themselves, the services that were offered on site were desert safari, camel riding, guided tours, tracking, camping, diving, snorkeling, bird watching, fishing, and hunting. Now, are all of these activities low impact as they should be? This is a question that we need to examine before we introduce any type of activities. Do we have the proper infrastructure in the park or in the protected area to manage these activities. In the case of bird watching, for example, we didn't have. So there are certain seasons where they close down the area completely because you cannot approach specific zones. Whereas if you can have like outposts for bird watching, you can, uh, you can actually avoid some of the uh, damages caused by visitation. Another question would be, what are the limits of acceptable change? Now, we agree that when we introduce visitors into a remote area or a preserved area, there must be some changes. What are these changes and to what extent do we accept these changes? Another question was, is activity-based sustainability or operations is it compromised by the shortage in infrastructure? And what would be the role of the different stakeholders in solving this problem? Now, when it comes to the environmental authorities, their role was basically to monitor the compliance uh, of all activities within the, the protectorate with the law resource management and site hardening, awareness campaigns to local community, scientific research, nature and culture interpretation, and they were providing a limited supply of tourism services. This, was, this came out as a surprise somehow. Whereas the industry were doing the marketing, the operations, the community development to a big extent, and the nature and culture interpretation. So there was a certain overlap between the two functions. But the question was, 
Is there enough coordination between the different actors? And the other question is, if we determine this, the roles, based on what do we determine these roles? So the normal reply would be, who does what best? Now, we don't know that because we've seen that the environmental authorities are engaging in tourism supply and we've seen that the private sector is engaging in other activities that should be part of uh, the environmental authorities' uh, work. Now, this is a representation of the three categories of impacts that we have. The biophysical, we have both the positive and the negative. This was the actual findings from the case study uh, that we had positive uh, impacts such as uh, prohibiting uh, hunting and improving the productivity, whereas there was, on the other side, habitat destruction. From the socioeconomic side, there was the employment, the income generation, the indirect involvement of different stakeholders, funding opportunities, and health services delivery. When we attracted, or when the tourism came to this area, it attracted more attention to the local community, and therefore it was followed by other services as well. On the negative side, we find the loss of traditional livelihoods. So the traditional or the local community that used to be, uh, uh, there were, they were hunters, they started to opt for something else. They started to go for tourism activities, and sometimes these activities were seasonal, so they had to give up their own livelihood for a seasonal activity. And it was also accompanied by an increase in the cost of living. And finally, on the last category, the cognitive category, we find visitors' education as a positive, because the people who went there, uh, most of them did not know about this being a protected area. So there was a lot of effort to inform them about the value of this protected area. And therefore, they were developing their or developing eco-sensitive behaviors. The capacity building for both the local communities, for the, the environmental authorities, for everyone involved in this process. Uh, the valuation of resources, because we started looking into what is the value of this resource. It was unused in the past, now it has a certain value. So we have to estimate this value and the increased ecotourism opportunities. Whereas on the other hand, on the negative side, we find that there was a negative effect of uh, commodification or turning the culture into a commodity that was served or offered for whoever pays for it. And this, is, this brings us to the first challenge, which is leaving the cultural heritage unprotected or ungoverned somehow. And the second negative effect is the possible conflicts over certain resources. Now, the challenge number five is community-based ecotourism development compromised by the low level of social development and absence of revenue earmarking mechanism. In the case of Wadi Gemel, uh, they were still thinking of introducing park fees. It was not implemented yet. It is still not implemented. It is still under study for a, a very long time. It's, um, they are finding difficulty in setting this structure. But the good news is that we have a new, uh, a new section that is totally devoted in the, in the uh, Ministry of Environmental Affairs that is totally devoted to this project. So they are developing uh, similar ideas in all protected areas in uh, making them self-financing. Uh, uh, the other thing are, is the, the lack of systematic efforts to manage stakeholders, particularly in lo local communities. Now, in the case of Wadi Gimel, again, there was a problem that occurred when uh, we had a private investor cooperating with the government in developing a tourism pro uh, project in the area. Now, what is the role of local community? They were working for this project. Now, we agree that 
cultural heritage is the highest attraction or the most important attraction. Now, who owns that attraction? It's the local community, right? But they don't have the right to use it. So it's the private investor that, that has the right to use it. And this is why we had a problem in stakeholders management. It was not, in this particular case, it was not systematically addressed. It was a problem that was solved, a problem really occurred and it was solved on the spot. Uh, but from what we have seen, there was no um, framework for solving these issues. Now, when it comes to the index of sustainable ecotourism impact, um, it is a multidisciplinary approach modeled after the alternative measures of welfare. So the suggested interdisciplinary approach uh, determines the destination's core conservation values as we have seen, whether it's ecological, cultural, or, or what natural, whatever. It assesses the destination's social goals. So using a com community sovereignty approach, we went in and asked the community, what are they expecting from ecotourism development? Uh, then we evaluate the contribution of the core elements to the achievement of these social goals. The innovative aspects of such uh, an index is the integration of environmental and social aspects into economic measures. Uh, the introduction of new elements in the definition of welfare, accounting for income inequalities, because we all know that tourism is uh, a tool to, uh, to address the problem of inequality. So we have rich people coming to poor areas and spending their money. Okay. Um, the results suggest the decoupling of economic growth from welfare. Now, the guiding principles of the index are, first of all, the calculation of the tourism consumption base for the region, accounting for uh, the distribution effects, accounting for the non-monetized contribution to well-being, uh, deducting the regrettables that occur from the introduction of uh, ecotourism, conducting the economic valuation uh, for the variables that were identified and integrating them in the decision-making process. And this is an example of the calculation that was done for the year 2007. So uh, we can see that we had around 70,000 visitors in 2007. Uh, and the, the overall number of their impact or economic total economic impact on, uh, on the region was around $6 million. Now, the importance of this index is basically the fact that it balances the triple bottom line of sustainability. It accounts for the triple bottom line of sustainability. It addresses both policymakers and the general public because we are using metrics that are known for both uh, the periodical monitoring uh, using consistent valuation techniques um, would allow us to get better results. And it is large or it is suggested to be used uh, to design targeted policies. So it depends on the priorities of the different, uh, different authorities. Uh, and therefore, you can go and measure what you are trying to achieve. Now, this slide is uh, probably a summary of the whole idea that the idea of sustainability, that we did not receive this land from our forefathers, we have only borrowed it uh, from our children. And the second point is that when you, when you can measure what you are speaking about and express it in numbers, you know something about it. Thank you. Mm -hmm.